Kicking off the list at number 10, Anthony the Vampire. Making his first appearance in Ultimate Avengers issue 14, Anthony was the greatest vampire hunter who ever walked this earth. He trained Daredevil, Blade, and Edward Cullen. Okay, the last one I lied about, but still, you get it. When he meets up with Blade later on, he has a new look. He was eventually bitten by a vampire, so he became their leader as well. The coolest part about Anthony is that he uses a Mark I Iron Man suit to get around during the day, so the sun doesn't, you know, evaporate him or whatever. He captured and turned Smart Hulk into to a bloodsucker, but his armor was stolen and used by Stick to fight back. Another Tony, another suit. Imagine you're in trouble and this guy rolls up on you. What a surprise that would be. Issue 16 of Ultimate Avengers opens with a great Twilight parody, but this is also the last time we see this Iron Man take flight. And that's because Hulk punched his head off, and usually when he does that, you don't come back. Vampire or not. Number nine, Iron Lantern. From the Amalgam Comic Universe, Iron Lantern is of course a millionaire who is in charge of Stark Aircraft. While he's working on a flight simulator, it straight up took off and flew him somewhere else. Best simulator ever, if I do say so myself. Then he crash landed on the ground, injuring Stark, and he realized he was brought to a crashed alien spaceship. That spaceship belonged to none other than Roman Sir, who died before getting a chance to talk to Hal Stark. Not being in the best condition, obviously, after the rocky landing, Hal started working with his newfound tech on a new suit hopefully to save his life. The Green Lantern upgrade of a suit saved his life for sure, but it also gave him the power to create anything out of green energy. He used a battery that reminded him of a lantern to do so. And then he went on to fight the aliens that had shot down Roman Sir and continued fighting enemies such as Madame Sapphire and Mandronesto, who yes, you already know exactly what I'm talking about. Before we continue on with this list, if you want to go ahead and give us a thumbs up, that would be great. It really helps us out here quite a bit. You're the best. Thank you so much for watching. Let's get right back into this list of weird Iron Mans. Number eight, Lord Iron. Coming from Marvel 1602, Lord Iron was amongst the other heroes who rose to fame, but a little bit back in time. See, Captain America was literally shot back in time, so the age of heroes has to begin there. And in turn, we get some fun versions of our Avengers. Anthony Stark was taken and held captive in the Holy Land during the English and Spanish War, a little different than the cave that he ended up with in our time. He was forced to make weapons still for them for weeks, mirroring Tony's origin in a fun, older way. David Banner was torturing him this time around though, so Anthony makes his own suit powered by lightning bottles, okay? Now, it doesn't matter which timeline Tony ends up in, he's destined to be Iron Man one way or another. Number seven, Iron Man Noir. Coming from the Noir series, Iron Man of Earth 90214 had to go all the way to Atlantis to fix his heart problem. What am I talking about? Let's find out. Tony in this reality was an industrialist adventurer. It feels like national treasure almost. We meet Tony and the crew and they're looking for something called the Jade Mask. This mask that was said to cure any kind of ailment, so he figured, hey, it's worth a shot to fix the old ticker. It didn't work, so some traders then revealed themselves once the mask was found, so Tony and Rhodey escaped and returned to New York. He goes on yet another treasure hunt with Rhodey, this time to Atlantis, because he heard a rumor that this power source could also do wonders to his heart, maybe, perhaps. Tony gets the trident, and again, he gets betrayed. Zemo and his forces were strong enough to kidnap Pepper, and Tony and Rhodes need a new plan. They travel to Zemo's castle, and it's then that it's revealed that Zemo is actually Tony's father, brainwashed by Strucker. And he was also equipped with Iron Man suits because action and adventure. As far as noir storylines go, Iron Man isn't my favorite, but the whole Nathan Drake vibe that Tony has is still quite fun. And also, Atlantis. It's kind of weird. Dive in. Number six, Earth X. Also known as Earth 9997, this version of Iron Man hit the pages back in Earth X issue zero. This time around, the human race is at risk due to the release of Terrigen Mists. So Tony decides, you know what, I'm just gonna isolate myself, not being sure how the mist would react, which is a fair point. So in turn, he would wear his armor all the time, then eventually he made an Iron Manor in New York. Super cautious, you know, with today's stuff going on, you can't really blame him. He went even further when he decided it was best to create his own team, the Iron Avengers. I was super paranoid. So eventually Galactus did come along, so Tony used his Iron Manor and distracted the Celestials beforehand. Now during this, Tony lost his life. Some wreckage impaled him, and for the first time in a while, Tony was able to breathe open air. How, you ask? Well, he died, and his soul immediately went to the realm of the dead, and that's when Captain Marvel's soul recruited him for an army set to take on death. Which is, first of all, nuts, because even after you die in Marvel Comics, you can't just chill out in heaven. You have to like go fight another war immediately. Like, come on. But death did eventually die, and that's when Tony got another huge upgrade in Paradise. Using the High Evolutionary's devices, Tony was changed into this angelic being, of course, still with wings. And he looked like Iron Man, so that's fun. You can customize your own angel outfit once you get up there. That's good to know. Number five. 
Tony Doom. Since What If is currently dropping weekly episodes on Disney Plus, we have to mention one of the more wild issues. What if Tony Stark had become Doctor Doom? It would probably be pretty bad. Yeah, yes it is. So here in the storyline that both of them go to the same college instead of Reed Richards being Victor's roommate. So now it's Tony. Two geniuses in one dorm. Sounds like they would make dreams come true, but in reality it was a living nightmare waiting to happen. Doom tricked Tony into switching bodies Freaky Friday style. And on top of that, Tony's memories were also wiped. So Tony in Doom's body gets in heat for the experiment and in turn he gets sent back to Liberia. Meanwhile, Doom is in line to take over Stark Industries. He still is Tony Stark, so down the road, Doom Industries was now a competitor to Stark Industries. He's brilliant in any way. The pair end up creating their own armors. Of course, Tony builds a red and gold Doom armor, while Doom makes a green and gray Iron Man armor. I'll give you a second to absorb that. There we go. It's a fun little swap with good action, but it's a little bit too confusing of a Freaky Friday type plot. But it's worth a shot. Go give it a try. Number four, Dead Man Walking. We look now over to Fantastic Four The End, released in 2007. Most of Tony's story here was the same, but during the mutant wars, Tony lost his life. Now, he didn't get redirected to a paradise where he would then become an Iron Man themed angel. Instead, he uploaded his subconsciousness into an AI. So now he lives through his armors, just swapping back and forth, walking around, which sounds like a solution, I guess, but living forever? Come on, Tony, I don't think that's a way to go, really. Number three, Steel Corpse. Tony and his suit have always been so close, it's had its back many times, sometimes even acting for itself and making a judgment call. Like in Iron Man 3, it literally woke Tony up from a nightmare aggressively. We love that future tech. But in the Age of X storyline, the suit literally has his back as Tony and the suit begin to merge. Ugh, I'm itchy just reading this. This started right after a virus began taking its toll on Tony. He was rapidly declining health-wise, so we chose a more fitting name, Steel Corpse, to be kind of funny, but also he looks like a corpse. So he's like, nah, I'm just gonna admit it. He, alongside other much healthier Avengers, were tasked to take down mutants, but when the gang got there, they of course opted to save them instead. Superhero twist of logic, we love it. Only Tony's advanced suit wasn't exactly on board with his new plan, and it started to act out by itself. It still wanted to save the day, although this was not the right way to do it. Captain America had no choice but to end the life of Steel Corpse in order to save the mutants. Number two, Iron Goblin. Making his first appearance in the Spider Island series, Iron Goblin wasn't made through any reality warping or anything like that. Instead, this happens during the resistance assault on Spider Queen, which is sounding crazier than what I just said. Tony Stark ends up getting captured and infected with the spider virus. He's going nuts at this point, so the rest of the heroes try and snap him out of it by using Goblin Formula, which is a solution, I guess, I don't know, read a book, read a comic book, Avengers. It's gonna, something bad's gonna happen. So he went from being a spider monster to Iron Goblin. Pretty crazy 24 hours for Tony. Tony was still Tony after this point though, despite the evil green look on his face. Like he even said Norman stole his armor before, so he was just evening it out. Haha, <laughs> he's funny. He's still Tony, nice. But as time went by, every minute that passed, that formula started to in fact change Tony. Like for example, he was flying around on the glider, although he can fly with his suit. It's not looking good. He knew he was going insane, so he sacrificed himself when the Queen's army attacked. Still a hero nonetheless, although he's mean and green and throwing pumpkin bombs. And finally, number one, Iron Hammer. Coming from Warp World, Iron Hammer, aka Stark Odinson, first came to life in issue three of Infinity Wars. So when Gamora had the Infinity Stones, she trapped everybody's soul in the Soul Gem and then folded the universe in half, which resulted in all of our heroes merging together. Pretty fun. So rightfully referred to as Warp World, we soon get to meet Soldier Supreme, Ghost Panther, Weapon Hex, and Iron Hammer. Stark Odinson in this pocket universe is the son, of course, of Howard Odin, chieftain of Asgard. He has the Iron Hammer armor, and of course he has a massive literal hammer of the gods to get the message across. Being a combination of both, he can face powerful villains like Stain Odinson, who is a blend of Loki and Obadiah Stain, and even Madam Hell, one of the coolest looking versions definitely, and also one of the more powerful, a great note to end on. Kicking off the list at number 10, the death of Anthony Stark. Yeah, the front page looks like that. Now imagine if that was the poster for Endgame. Oh God, so many tears, so many more tears rather. Hey -oh. This issue is wild. It shows all these superheroes mourning the loss of their friend and fellow Avenger. Even Doctor Doom's mourning. He does like a toast. He's a villain. What's going on? He's like, ah, yes, let us drink now to the memory of a worthy opponent. And to make things even crazier, he writes a note to Rhodey that says, this key card will give you full access to the entire complex. Take this CD to my office, play it on the AV system, boom. The guy's carrying around super suits and briefcases but he gives Rhodey a compact disc. Gotta love the time. So he puts it in and clicks play and it's so sad. It shows Stark explaining that somebody has to continue after him. 
And then bam, you see a suit made just for Rhodey. <sighs> what a moment. Tony continues to say that Iron Man was the greatest thing he's ever invented and he doesn't want it to die with him. What a message, so moving, I'm touched personally. It's overwhelming for Rhodey, I mean of course, all this newfound responsibility of being Iron Man, plus, oh, mourning your best friend, Ao, that's a tough one, what a week. So finally he suits up and it's so badass. Tony Stark may be dead, but Iron Man lives again. So lovely, and the best part, turns out Tony wasn't actually dead at all, rather just under chirogenic stasis until a scientist sorted out his back problems. Yeah, psych, gotcha, made you luck. And before we go on to number nine, guys, if you could please go ahead and toss us a thumbs up for this video because it helps us out here quite a bit. You guys are the best. All right, now back to zombie Tony Stark. Number nine, zombie time. Marvel's zombie is amazing. I mean, it's absolutely disgusting and terrifying, but amazing nonetheless. So Marvel Zombies is a five-part series written by Robert Kirkman, and it doesn't hold back. I mean, right off the hop, we see Spider-Man with his leg just like messed up, he's like eating people. It's gross. It's kind of like these heroes in a way you don't want to see them, but you kind of do want to see them. That's gross, I don't know. And then we also see Captain America with the top of his head just sliced off, just boop, gone. Everybody's like, hey, Cap, you know, your brains are hanging out of your head. And then he grabs some brain tissue and says, nope, not all of them. <laughs> and then in comes Tony Stark. He goes detective mode, right? He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. So you're telling me there's no Magneto left? He just burned away? Banner is only Banner after he eats, and Spider-Man's all emotional, like he just had some yum-yums. You didn't save any for me, interesting. It's a really wild way to see Tony's leadership, especially considering the context. He's like, give me your face now, I wanna eat it. I'm sure the Green Goblin can board some more bacon. Do this shit supposed to last us till we get rescued? Number eight, Iron Man and Titanium Man. All the medals, all the men, bam, explosions. In Tales of Suspense issue 69, we see another metal guy. This time, he's green. Oh, oh. Like that, it's green. You can't see, but it's green. Ah, there we are, now it's green. Titanium Man, how exciting. They make this big event, right, to watch the two smash heads. It's like a UFC fight, but with monologues and narrating every single fight move you're gonna make. If you skip this issue, that's fine. You're not missing out. There's a guy in a suit who thinks he's better, and he's actually slower and way more stupid. Yeah, there it is. He wants all the eyes and ears on him, of course. He likes attention, but when it comes to brass tacks, <laughs> You don't stand a chance, Boris Bolsky. More like Boris Bolsh. Number seven, Superior Iron Man. This is a fun one, but still a little out of character from the Tony that most of us know. So the issue itself starts off pretty neat, okay? It kind of mirrors the tech that he has in his latest films. He can control his suit, fly in it, fly around, high five babies, all that cool stuff, all while laying in a pool, sipping on drinks. Yeah, his new extremist armor was fascinating. So much so that Tony released it as a smartphone app. Yeah, imagine having that at the bottom. You got messages, Instagram, some extremists, and then Angry Birds too. You know, all the essentials, for sure. So this app allowed people to change their bodies using this virus, becoming however they wanted. What a dream come true. And then Tony does the ultimate move and says the app is actually just a free trial. Yeah, if you want to continue it, you gotta pay $100 a day. Honestly, it's not bad. I mean, dudes are out here buying PlayStation 5s for like three grand. That's not a bad price for some Tony tech. I'll just get my buddy Matt from grade 10 to jailbreak my phone again, just like the old days. And we're good. Number six, demon in a bottle. Now sure, Tony's struggling with addictions isn't weird per se, but it is a plot device that we're not gonna see in future MCU movies. I mean, we saw a little glimpse of it in Iron Man 2, but not too much, of course, because kids are like, why is he dying? Why is he drinking things? What's going on? So this character arc begins in Iron Man issue 120, and it lasts about nine issues. At first, we see Tony, and he's just slamming drinks like it's prom night, all right? The opening shot, we see like three mini bottles of gin, and then Tony orders more. So the flight attendant's like, hey, how about a magazine to read? And Tony's like, hey, how about another martini? And she even tries to cut him off, but he insists that he's drinking for two. The other, of course, being his Iron Man persona. Always a healthy sign. Oh, me, I'm drinking for myself and also this H&M sweater, so I need two, thank you. What happens when you have a superhero who loves slamming martinis? Well, you get Tony Stark flying through the air, drunk, spreading toxic fumes all over a crowd. He's kind of like Hancock in a way, just dangerous. Funny, but dangerous. The alcohol addiction was, of course, put to the side with the MCU story, I think. God, that would take us out of the movie, I think, just a little bit. Like if Tony snapped his fingers and then like a bottle of gin appeared and he's like, perfect, 
Number five, Ultimate Three. So since Iron Man 2, we're talking about it a little bit, we saw the relationship between Black Widow and Tony get stronger, and they get really close, but not Ultimate Three close, heh <laughs> So the 2008 five-parter opens up with this shot. All the Ultimates just hanging out in Tony's mansion, and then in the background, there's a tape playing. This tape being Black Widow and Tony Stark, doing the thing. Check it out. The issue itself is titled Sex, Lies, and DVDs. Not even Blu-ray either, eh? just DVDs. So what's the deal? Why does this exist? Well, in The Ultimates 2, her and Iron Man dated and of course got engaged, but it's all a lie. <gasps> a sham. She was trying to destroy the Avengers for the fall of the Soviet Union. That is, until she's killed by Hawkeye. So after she's dead, the tape gets released. People are selling DVDs of it on the streets of New York. It's kind of like in Luke Cage where people are selling footage of the incident. But imagine if they were selling that incident. Some of these stories just need to stay in pages, I think. Number four, the new Iron Man. The Invincible Iron Man issue 21 had a pretty eye-opening front page illustration. It's Tony Stark quitting. The front page even says, no, this is not a nightmare. So he decides that flying around in a super suit just doesn't blend well with the old ticker, right? He's got heart problems going on. So he looks at somebody else to take on the mantle of Iron Man. So who does he go to besides Eddie March, the famous fighter with brain trauma and damage? Awesome. So he suits up and he loves it, of course. I mean, he's adding quips, he's boxing people. He's making it his own, you know? He's just having a good time. And then Crimson Dynamo ruins that and Tony is forced to return to the tin. I'm surprised he didn't ask Mike Tyson. I mean, his name is already Iron Mike Tyson. Number three, Convention of Fear. If you're watching this video right now or you're part of our over 1 million subscribers, confetti, odds are you ventured around a comic book convention or two. So in Iron Man issue 72 titled Convention of Fear, it shows our man in a can getting the job done and taking out low-level villains like Man Bull, Whiplash, The Melter, all in the home of a comic convention. And of course the battle comes to an awesome end with fans hailing Iron Man, like real fans too, at this convention. I mean, New York is a pretty common battle place, but a fan convention? I don't know, might be a little bit too meta. Number two, Iron Man Otar. I mean, it doesn't get much weirder than this. We got Tony Stark squaring up against a Minotaur. And the other plot going on is this weird love triangle with Jasper Sitwell and then Whitney Frost. So the whole time you're kind of raising an eyebrow. The issue as a whole is odd. He doesn't even do well against the Minotaur. Like this dude struggles to fight the Minotaur. Then in the last second, Miklos the Minotaur has a change of heart and helps Iron Man save Whitney. Ah, it's great, super thrilling. We love happy endings, I guess. We love to see characters lose control and then immediately gain control only moments later. That's my secret, Cap. I'm always a Minotaur in control. <laughs> Sorry boys, uh, momentary loss of motor And finally, number one trapped by the Red Barbarian. Remember that part in Winter Soldier where Natasha Romanoff has that amazing face changing technology that for sure could have come in handy for literally any other movie? Well, in Tales of Suspense issue 42, we see a drawn out version of that idea with the actor. The actor is an interesting lad. He can resemble almost anybody. And in his words, he says, with the aid of a little makeup. Ah, yes. Changing your entire appearance? Haha, -ha, just dab some eyeshadow on. That should do it, says the actor. So the actor steals some tech from Stark because, well, of course he does. And then Tony makes the Red Army believe that he's the actor because they look the same, and then he steals it back. Then the real actor actor gets killed because they don't believe that the real actor actor is. Does your brain hurt? My brain kind of hurts. Cool, let's just end it there. Number 10, Mark 1, Model 3. Okay, I want to get it out of the way right now that I am in no way talking smack about the design of the original Iron Man suit. I mean, although it was bulky and cumbersome, it's absolutely an iconic design, and more importantly, it was built with a purpose. Tony found himself in a bad situation and needed to escape, so he built an armor out of any materials available to him. Makes absolute sense. The uh, quote-unquote upgraded gold version of this suit, however, uh, not so much. Tony decided that the gray color of his armor was far too scary, or I guess he was kind of told that because the biggest inspiration for this redesign came from a date with Marion Rogers, who told Tony that Iron Man could really use a nice paint job, so that he'd better resemble a knight in shining armor. Tony obviously took this to heart and the gold armor was born because he thought it would make him a more approachable hero. This design obviously didn't stick around for too long, as not long after he adopted the first iteration of the classic red and gold color scheme that the world now knows so well and loves. Fun fact though, the gold plated armor is actually the reason Iron Man has the nickname the Golden Avenger. Check out the Mark 1 in its first appearance in 
1963's Tales of Suspense number 39. Number 9, Mark 33 Submarine Argonaut. The Mark 33 armor isn't the first deep sea variant of the Iron Man armor, but it is pretty bad if I do say so myself. It is one of the five different Iron Man armors that Tony created from the Argonaut series, developed to augment his extremist based armor technology. The Submarine Argonaut was a yellow armor that had clawed hands and feet, was capable of a little bit of camouflage, and had a deep sea range of about 2,563 meters. Basically, it was a pressurized suit that allowed Tony to operate in the deepest depths of the ocean. Now, why is this a dumb armor, you ask? Well, mostly because Tony never actually got around to using it, or any of the five Argonaut suits for that matter. The armors were instead triggered via remote when the son of Ho Yinsen was shot and killed by shield forces. This armor then attacked Namor and was later destroyed by Iron Man himself and left to to sink to the bottom of the ocean and has not been seen since. It was just kind of left there. Check out this sad underwater armor for yourself in its first appearance in 2006's Iron Man Volume 4, number 7. Number 8, Heroes Reborn. In 1996, Marvel created the controversial Heroes Reborn event slash storyline in an attempt to reboot some of their characters. Tony Stark was no exception and he was reborn in a new universe where he was even more of a selfish jerk than usual. And when he was wounded in an attack, Tony took up a special suit of armor to become a hero. Referred to in the storyline as the Prometheum armor, this rather unique looking suit was exclusive to the Heroes Reborn universe and honestly wasn't too well received. While most of Iron Man's armors tend to be clean and simplified in appearance, the Heroes Reborn armor took a different approach. With steel cords, lots of tubing, and two just massive exhaust pipes on the back that allow the armor to release heat. Though just a prototype, Tony was required to wear this armor's chest plate at all times in order to keep his heart beating and his lungs functioning properly. The suit didn't have an arc reactor and had to constantly be recharged in order to keep pumping. Overall, this armor was overly bulky and not visually appealing in the slightest. Instead of the more streamlined direction the armors had been going in, this one takes a step backwards, adding in musculature and separate plates that made it just way too complicated. Check it out for yourself in 1996's Iron Man and volume 2, number 1. Number 7, Mark 52 Hulkbuster Car. Now, if you're not familiar with this armor, don't worry, I also didn't know it existed until today. The Mark 52 is actually just the Mark 44 Hulkbuster scene in the MCU, but unlike the MCU's take on the comics Hulkbuster, this suit was also a car for some reason. Yep, that's right, what looks just like a simple flying car is actually a fully functioning Iron Man armor that could be deployed from the push of a button. Now, in its vehicle form, the armor can achieve flight with the use of two repulsor turbines on its bottom, and then by pressing the button on the car's panel, the entire thing transformed into a Hulkbuster armor in a matter of seconds. It's basically just a transformer. This marked the first time a suit of armor in the Marvel Universe continuity was adapted from the MCU. While certain artists' depiction of the Iron Man armor Mark 42 included a helmet design lifted from the standard Iron Man helmet outline used in the MCU, the Mark 52 is the first armor with a design taken straight and entirely from the films. Now, why Tony decided he needed another Hulkbuster at this point in time is beyond me because he certainly was not fighting any big bad guys. But also why he thought it needed to be a flying car as well just makes absolutely no sense. Like, he really wasn't struggling for any money because he had just sold Stark Tower at the time, and I don't know, maybe he just wanted to see if it was possible. Either way, check it out for yourself in 2016's all new, all different Avengers, number one. Number six, ablative armor. This is another one of Tony's armors that wasn't supposed to be dumb, silly, or weird, it just kind of turned out that way. The ablative armor was a prototype space armor designed for an impact heavy environment. It's made up of tile pieces that could be manipulated by a force field to dynamically protect him from projectile attacks, while also being used as ranged weapons as well. Basically, picture those bicycle helmets that were specifically designed to break on impact as a way to absorb the shock of the crash and thus protect the bicyclist's head. That's the sort of design Tony was going for with this armor, made entirely of little tiles that are designed in such a way to, you guessed it, break on impact. Once a tile is broken, it pops off and another one slides into its place and new tiles are constantly being generated. And they're even capable of separating from the armor and, you know, kind of just doing their own thing. There's no doubt that it's a unique concept and might be one that Tony would would come back to later on, but it's a little bit clunky and overall just a little nightmarish to look at. Take a look for yourself starting with his first appearance in 2003's Iron Man Volume 3, number 71. Number 5, 1602 Armor. I think that everyone can see what Neil Gaiman and Adam Kubert were going for with the Iron Man design from the 1602 miniseries. It is a steampunk-esque design from the Middle Ages, and that sounds like a great idea on paper, but in execution, it's actually very over-designed and somehow more complex than the Mark I armor. In the world of 1602, Anthony Stark is Lord Iron, a man who is taken captive during the Anglo-Spanish War and forced to make weapons, after being subjected to torture by this universe's version of Bruce Banner named David Banner. Later on, after Banner becomes the Hulk, Stark is 
summoned by the King of England to track Banner down. Needing some sort of protection in order to survive, Stark dons his iron armor that is powered by lightning bottles that provides him with super strength and near invulnerability alongside a couple other fun electricity powered gadgets. Stark eventually found the Hulk and despite his pleas for forgiveness, Stark continued to attack him until a much bigger threat forced the two of them to team up. With a busy paint scheme and design, the 1602 armor ends up making Iron Man look a bit like a Doctor Who villain, which probably wasn't the intention and that is why it's on this list today. Check it out in 2005's Marvel 1602, New World number 2. Number 4, Mark VI Hydro Armor. So usually whenever Tony has to go underwater, he just dives right in and the armor protects him. However, in a few cases, Tony has had to dive pretty deep into the ocean, and obviously the pressure could crush even a regular armored suit with ease. So Tony wound up creating a special armor built to withstand those pressures, which became the Mark VI Hydro Armor. The Hydro Armor has all the standard features of the regular Iron Man suits, but reconfigured to be more effective underwater. That means there's carefully adapted repulsor beams, more life support, grapples, a feature that fires an underwater electric shock, and the ability to release an inky chemical like an octopus. The armor is treated with lights and a bioluminescence to allow Tony to see in the pitch darkness of the oceans. It's also maneuverable enough for Tony to handle fighting whales, sharks, or the submariner himself. He doesn't use it as often as other armors, but this suit proves Tony can handle pretty much any environment pretty well. Now why is this armor dumb you ask? Well, like I said, he doesn't use it too often, but also because he's wearing armor just inside another armor. You can imagine how uncomfortable that would be, and honestly you'd think with those seemingly endless resources, he would just make one that just did everything. Check out the first Hydra armor in 1987's Iron Man number 218. Number 3, Mark 19 Skin Armor. Now it seems to me that Tony Stark is really into that whole metal but make it weird concept when it comes to his armors, and that is definitely seen in one of his earliest experiments with that concept, the skin armor. This suit was made of an adaptive liquid alloy that could simultaneously become as hard as adamantium, and yet stay flexible enough to bounce and bend comfortably. It's a super cool concept and made for a pretty badass suit since it features some upgraded versions of Stark's existing tech and was able to be controlled remotely. However, the way this suit formed is actually what makes it a rather dumb design. Basically, the flexible ally only formed the gold sections of its armor and would only harden or form around the red parts on command, meaning that Tony would be running around like looking half dressed most of the time, which is pretty ridiculous. Check it out for yourself in 2001's Iron Man Volume 3, number 42, and let me know what you think of it in the comments below. Number 2, Iron Lantern. Hailing from Marvel and DC's Amalgam Universe comes Harold Stark, a combination of Hal Jordan and Tony Stark, who acts as a hero under the name of Iron Lantern. In this reality, Stark was injured after an alien ship crashed into Earth. Earth, and in an attempt to stay alive, he made an armor out of the wreckage of the ship, using the lantern power battery he found as the power source. This suit not only allowed him to survive, it also granted him all of the powers of the Green Lantern. Using these newfound powers, Stark was operating as the Iron Lantern and took down many powerful enemies such as Madame Sapphire, Great White, and of course his arch nemesis, Mandarin Estro. Now I want to get it out of the way that I love the Amalgam Universe, I've talked about it in so many other videos, but honestly this hero just isn't doing it for me. Iron Man's calling card is that he's just a man, but with that ring, the iron seems pretty redundant and kind of eliminates the humanity imbued into Tony Stark. Check it out for yourself in 1997's Iron Lantern, number one. And number one, the Sniff Buster. Now you're probably sitting there like, what are you talking about? That doesn't exist. And I mean, technically you're right since I completely made up the name, but It'll all make sense once I explain the suit a little bit more. For a period of time, Iron Man's armor had a big old nose on the front of it. The true story is that Stan Lee, upon seeing an Iron Man cover, made an offhand comment asking, hey, Where's the nose? Meaning that he thought the helmet just looked a little bit too snug to Tony's face for a nose to fit. However, this comment was misinterpreted terribly by others as meaning that Stan wanted a nose on the armor, so it ended up being added. They forced an in-story explanation for the iron nose with Tony stating that he redesigned the mask to allow for a bit more expression, which would thus increase the fearsome aspects of his character. To no surprise, no one in the Marvel Universe bought it and many characters remarked how ridiculous Iron Man's nose hole made him look. Luckily, the nasal armor was relatively short-lived and has not reemerged since. Go take a look at it for yourself in 1974's The Invincible Iron Man number 68. Starting us off in at number 10, Iron Man from Earth 2020. This version of Iron Man appeared in the early 2000s run of Exiles. He's an ex-member of a team known as Weapon X. Weapon X, not to be confused with the secret program responsible for Wolverine, is similar to the Exiles. They are multiversal hopping travelers and reality fixers, but are notably more ruthless and violent than the Exiles team. And this Tony follows suit. He's cruel and was sent back to his native reality once his Weapon X team was defeated. So what does Tony do now that he's not spending his time jumping around the multiverse? 
Well, he decided to start a world war. That's just a natural progression, right? He commits a bunch of crimes against humanity and even gets himself wanted for treason. He eventually was defeated by Morph, who put an end to him by hitting a reboot button on his back. Just kind of anticlimactic if you think about it. Moving on to our number nine spot, let's take a look at a man who isn't Tony Stark, but his suit is very much inspired by Iron Man, Ironmonger. We're taking a little detour from the comics at this number and looking at the MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Specifically looking at the first Iron Man film and Obadiah Stane, who was played by Jeff Bridges. Stane is Ironmonger, a character who worked for Stark in the 2008 Iron Man movie, but then betrayed him taking his initial design of the Iron Man armor and expanding upon it. This led to an imitation Hulkbuster suit known as Ironmonger, which is an alternate version of the Iron Man suit rather than of Tony himself. Stain became the CEO of Stark Industries after Howard Stark's death prior to Tony coming of age shortly afterwards. Now because of this, he's always resented Tony, which caused Stain to join up with the Ten Rings in order to attempt to assassinate the younger Stark. He was then exposed by Pepper Potts and created this armor to take Tony out himself. Fortunately for Tony, Stane's Ironmonger wasn't nearly as powerful as his original suit, and he ended up killing himself in an act of cowardice rather than be arrested. Moving on to number eight, Iron Giant Man. Back to Tony Stark's with this number. So this version of Stark comes from the Mutant X universe known as Earth-1298. Not a whole lot is known about him. There was some inaccurate information about the character passed on by the Yellow Jacket of that Earth, which doesn't help us much. But it was believed that this Tony had been killed in action. Turns out that wasn't the case. So this Tony has got some pretty narrow-minded views in this universe, being part of an anti-mutant version of the Avengers. And based off of his name, you've probably already figured out that he's got both the powers of Iron Man and Giant Man in this universe, making his prejudice and oppression even harder to tackle. He ends up getting killed alongside the other Avengers by a version of Captain America known as X-Man. In our number seven spot, Tony Stark of Earth-11029. This alternate version of Stark comes at us from 2010's What If Iron Man Demon in an Armor, which is set on Earth 11029. The concept behind this hypothetical tale is, would Tony Stark still be Iron Man if he wasn't Tony Stark? The short answer is kind of. This story places Stark as Victor Von Doom's roommate in college instead of Reed Richards. In an experiment gone wrong, the two have switched bodies with Tony becoming Doom, working to rebuild his reputation, and Doom now in Tony's body, using his resources for world domination. Stark has no memory of his past and truly believes that he is Victor, but with amnesia, so he rebuilds his life. This culminates into a face-off later on down the road, where Doom Tony and Victor Stark have switched armor, having developed each his individual armor on their own, but following their own color coding, of course. For example, Doom now has a green and silver Iron Man suit, while the real Tony has a gold and red cloak. Doom reveals to Tony the truth of their switch, but Tony decides to continue living as Doom, since Doom destroyed the name of Tony Stark while he rebuilt the one of Victor Von Doom. Moving on to number six, New Universal. Tony Stark of this reality was born in 1938 and was a lackluster student prior to 1953. That was when the fireworks happened. This universe is equivalent to the white event, which is a paradigm shift that acts as a cosmic trigger. Because of this, Tony's intelligence was augmented and he began crafting technology far ahead of its time, despite a slight drinking problem. Then in 1959, a plane that Tony was on crashed in Vietnam and he was taken captive. He would escape after wearing a mechanical suit designed from spare parts. Sounds familiar, right? Now this is where things get real funky. Tony returns to the US, but was held at a naval base in San Diego for interrogation by national security agents Philip Voigt and Joe Swan, who believe that Stark's intelligence came from the fireworks event. Now after they confirmed this was true, Voigt shot Stark in the head, killing him. Why? Because Earth 555, the alternate universe where the new Universal storyline takes place, the US is an isolationist nation, and superheroes' existence are not publicly known. Rather, the US government monitors these individuals, and Stark's existence, well, seemed more of a threat than a friendly matter. Moving on to number five, Superior Iron Man. In 2014, Marvel released the crossover event Axis, in which Red Skull harnesses the abilities of Charles Xavier and of Onslaught, who, for those of you who don't know, was a psychic entity amalgamation of Xavier's darkest parts and also of Magneto's, and the story was kind of meh and led to Heroes Reborn, which is just bleh. Anyway, the Avengers and the X-Men would team up to take the supervillain on, and during Axis's events, the morality of all the characters involved would be inverted, or reversed rather, thanks to a spell. 
In other words, the heroes were villains and the villains were good. During the end of the event, the evil version of Tony was able to shield himself when the spell was undone, retaining his villainous personality. This corrupt Tony began to infiltrate society, fully leaning into his egotistical tendencies and becoming a bit of a monster. He would release Extremist 3.0 to the public via a mobile app, getting people addicted to it and then depriving them of further upgrades until they paid the $100 fee. As you can imagine, this turned a bunch of people into drug addicts. He also started to expand his empire, forcefully buying out other companies and even unleashing an army of drones to act as his personal police force. In at number four, the Steel Corpse from Earth 11326. Ah, what a name. This one isn't scary because the Steel Corpse is a bad guy. It's scary because the name Steel Corpse refers to the fact that this version of Tony Stark is slowly being consumed and digested by his Iron Man suit. Kinda messed up, isn't it? Stark sees humor in it though, giving himself that name jokingly thanks to the fact that he's essentially a corpse animated by machinery after he was infected with a virus that permanently fused him to his suit. He's also prejudiced towards mutants and worked with the Avengers to intervene a mutant riot, getting some kicks from repressing and murdering some of the mutants present. So yeah, still scary because he is a bad guy, but scarier because he's a highly intelligent corpse in a living machine. Perhaps what's worse is that the armor is able to function independently from Tony's will. And that's kind of terrifying. In at number three, Ruins. Ah, Ruins, the universe that makes you feel gross about everything in superhero comics. The Ruins version of Tony Stark is known as the Man in the Iron Mask. Now for context, Ruins is an alternate reality in which the events that gave our heroes their powers in the 616 end up deforming them or killing them in this universe. It's hyper-realistic and also incredibly depressing. For example, Bruce Banner's gamma radiation doesn't turn him into the Hulk, but rather it turns him into a giant green tumor. It's pretty nasty, give it a Google. Back to Stark though. This version of Tony was meant to go to Vietnam to end the war, but instead found himself at a pro-successionism movement in California, where he tried to mediate the situation. He was injured by a grenade, which led to him building his Iron Man suit of armor. He would then work with Hank Pym and Stephen Strange to create the Avengers, which was a revolutionary force whose goal was to liberate California. But the successionist movement defeated them first, gunning down the Quinjet and effectively murdering Stark and Pym in the process. Scary reality because it's kind of realistic. And at number two, Iron Maniac from Earth 5012. Iron Maniac is the ultimate evil Iron Man. And he's scary as f First appearing in Marvel Team Up Volume 3, Issue 2 in 2005, this version of Iron Man is also entangled with Victor Von Doom, but in a very different narrative from the one from Earth 11029. Iron Maniac, who hails from Earth 5012, comes from an Earth that was ravaged by war, with many heroes dying as a result. Because of his allies and friends dying, Stark became more violent in his grief. He's got major beef with the Reed Richards of this world. While we never fully know what he blames Reed for, it's implied that Reed's actions caused several deaths. Stark sees him as a psychopath. And because of this, Stark would adopt armor that looked a whole lot like Doctor Doom's. And he even fought against the Fantastic Four. He actually killed the Human Torch, who, in the process, burnt his face. See the, the Doom? relation there. Richards would then dispose of Stark by sending him to the 616 universe where he encountered the 616 Fantastic Four, who mistook him for Doctor Doom returning. Stark revealed his identity, then posed as the 616 Iron Man, and despite being captured by Captain America, Black Widow, Spider-Man, and X-23, he would go on a new rampage until he was finally stopped by the hero Freedom Ring, who sacrificed his life to put an end to Tony's reign of terror. And last but not least, in a number one, Marvel Zombies. Ah, Marvel Zombies, a staple in our top 10 scary alternate lists. Because hey, when your favorite superheroes become decomposing flesh and want to eat up all of humanity, you bet your butt we consider that horrifying. But let's backtrack for a sec here. The Marvel Zombies universe is Earth 2149, a place that was infected thanks to an alternate version of Sentry who carried the infection and punched his way into this reality and infected everyone. This version of Stark was working on a teleportation device that could help those uninfected in this reality escape to another. But unfortunately, a zombified version of the Fantastic Four broke into the lab where Stark was, and Stark was not wearing his Iron Man suit at the time, so he got infected. As a zombie, Stark led the charge against Silver Surfer when Silver Surfer arrived in New York. Despite Surfer blasting Stark's legs off, he and other zombified characters attacked the Surfer and then were imbued with the power cosmic after consuming him. 
Along with the other Power Cosmic Zombies, Stark would devour Galactus after attacking him with a gun-like contraption that combined all their powers into one beam. And yeah, they ate Galactus, and gained his powers, and then called themselves the Zombie Galacti. Eventually, Stark would build cybernetic limbs to replace his legs, reverting to his original costume despite being a zombie. I don't know about you guys, but a zombie with that much power is one that I could definitely do without. Thank you.